Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jessie Isley with Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, and I'm so excited that you've joined us tonight for a special program featuring a very special guest. This month, the library is celebrating DIA, a nationally recognized initiative that emphasizes the importance of literacy for children from all backgrounds. It is a daily commitment to linking children and their families to diverse books, languages, and cultures. For our program this evening, we are thrilled to welcome acclaimed illustrator and author Suzanne Bloom. Suzanne is the author and illustrator of the picture books featuring Goose and Bear, A Splendid Friend Indeed, The Bus for Us, and many other cherished titles. Join us as Suzanne shares her experiences developing diverse children's book characters in honor of DIA 2021. Welcome, Suzanne. We are so excited to have you. Thank you, Jesse. And first, thanks to the library um, for having me. Thank you, Jesse, for all your technical help. I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> and, uh, I remember coming to your library about 10 years ago, and I loved it. I loved the inscriptions outside. And now I wish that I had taken a picture of every single one, because it would have been nice to remember those. Um, I want to talk about my books and the books of other authors and illustrators and um, uh, what what guides me when I'm thinking about doing a story. But first, I just have to say I, I spent the last, uh, it felt like 12 hours, but it was probably only 50 minutes, maybe 45, going through the big, the best word book ever with my grand toddler. And that this is an old book. I went through this with my sons as well. And there's there's not a story, but there's a theme on each page. So we spend all that time finding the red trucks or the blue shirts. Uh, there's so much to look at. And a book like this teaches us how to use a book, how to open it up and look across the entire page you could pick any page in this book and find loads of things to look at and to keep you on that page for, for a few minutes. Now, I know not every child wants to sit still and look at a book. And that's okay, because sometimes this darling light of my life is running around and shrieking, will come back, will look at a page, and then continues with their activity. So there are many approaches, and as long as you're willing, willing to sit and share that experience, it's uh, it's a beautiful thing, and it's one of my favorite things. Um, I'd like to show you a few slides about myself and my life and some of the work that I do, and then I will read a book. Oh, that is adorable me. I was probably five years old, and I'm pretty sure I reached me peak. And next up is my kindergarten class in Portland, Oregon. Um, there's a little girl whose head is turned toward the camera, not paying attention. I'm pretty sure that's me. Mm -hmm. But, it, <clears throat> and in the description, I said that I came from cowboys and queens. My grandfather really was a cowboy. And that's a picture of his boots. Uh, that is my first documented drawing at the age of three, and I'm sure it looks a lot like most three-year-old drawings. Uh, as I got older, reaching the more mature age of five, my drawings were more expansive and expressive, but it still probably looks a lot like every five-year-old drawing that you see. The next one, I think, is first grade. Now, it's a blue building. It might be my grandmother's apartment. Who remembers, right? But it's uh, it denotes a pattern. I do like blue. And in fact, the next picture is of a poem that I had published in a teacher's magazine, and it's called Blue. Blue is my favorite color, the color of the sky. I won't go any further. Let's hit the next slide. Colors. I love colors. Deep, rich wonderful colors. I am, I am so, so taken by rich colors. 
Oh, I thought you might like to see a picture of one of my working spaces. This one um, is gave way to the next one. But you can see there's my teddy bear. And you can see in this one, um, it was supposed to get better, but it got worse. I have shelves filled, filled, filled with books and art supplies. The next one, you may think it looks neater. And that's my view outside. I live in the country. Uh, and I have a big yard and lots of green trees. And they're just greening up right now. It's absolutely beautiful. This is my favorite time. And then the next one is uh what the wall looks like when i'm working on a project i have to have everything up so that i can see every single picture and see how it progresses who's in the picture how much space do they take up do they shift from the left to the right side i just need to see everything at the same time and in the next slide you will see my brand new studio in which I finished my 21st book. So I'm I'm on to the 22nd book. The only thing is I don't know what it's which one it's gonna be. I don't know if it's gonna be about babies or an old zoo that's being refurbished, or I don't know. I'll find out. I'll let you know when I figure it out. Then we have, oh yeah, I wanted to show you these cabbages because we're talking about characters and character development. And I wanted to show you with a cabbage, I mean, I think I probably made that first slice and said, oh, that looks like a face. Now, I wonder if I put some olives on it for eyes, then what would it look like? Oh, it looks a little surprised in that picture. What if I spread those eyes apart just a little bit? Then what, mmm, <gasps> that looks like the scientist in um, um, Lilo and Stitch, doesn't it? That's what it looks like to me. And then in the last one, those eyes are way back and, and up, and it just has a different character. So when I'm drawing, I have to be very aware of where I'm placing the eyes, what the posture is going to be like, um, and, and what the facial expression will be, because that's as much a part of the story as the words. And next, what do we have? Oh, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. This lady has a pet iguana. It's four feet long. Yes, I can hear you going, oh my goodness. Oh, I would never have one of those. Well, I wouldn't, but she does. And it's it's a beauty, I have to say. But it's, it's very um, impressively large. So I just thought, you know, this could become a character someday in a story. And the lady too, maybe. Who knows? And then I'm showing you things that inspire me. Those are such a snazzy pair of boots. I love them. I did not buy them. I'm sure they weren't in my size. But again, I needed to document them. I needed to take that picture and share uh, what's out there. There's so much in the world that we don't own and we don't need to own, but we can see and enjoy. What did I do next? Hmm. Ah, this was direct inspiration for the book that I wrote called I Just Like You. I was talking to young students and we were sort of waiting for everybody to come into the room. And I drew this aardvark and bear and I drew a speech bubble and I asked the young listeners, what would you say to somebody if you were trying to make a friend, if you were, you know, wanted to learn about them? And so those are things that came up and wrote. One was a compliment. I like your flip-flops. That one went right into my book. Um, do you like to do thus and such? Uh, I do too. And then you can see people wrote in their mother tongues as well. So this was very, very helpful for me. I was glad to have that outside influence. <laughs> books, books can take you all over. I, I never thought I would travel. 
And yet so far I've been to Ireland and China and Italy. And of course I take pictures in the hopes that I can gain some inspiration. Maybe it's the way somebody's sitting or laughing. And so this was uh, when I went to China for about two weeks and visited different schools there. It was a great experience, of course. And not everybody can travel. Not everybody can go to different places. And that's another way that books bring us the world. So in the next slide, oh, just another little inspiration. I actually found this picture after I had made my drawing. And you'll see the drawing in a couple of slides. Um, here's just a little girl pulling a little tiny wagon stacked with books. And I have used that motif a couple of times. But you'll see it, I think, in two more slides where I used it with Samantha the Anteater. Self-portrait, me as a bear. I like being a bear. Um, I think I look good as a bear. So this is going to be some of my characters following this bear. And I know that that is Samantha the Anteater. And you can see the little red wagon that she's pulling behind her tricycle. And she has a checkered lunchbox on top. And this is from a mighty fine time machine. And we'll talk about that later too. Ah, uh, little fox. Little Fox is hoping that Bear and Goose are making something for her. And they won't tell her what it is, but she's kind of complaining about it. She said, oh, these are too big. These are too hot. Uh, you know, I hope, I'm glad it's not for me. We'll see what happens, though. This is a character for whom I have a story. This is Hugo. Um, but I have never submitted it to a publisher yet. So they're just sitting around, hanging around, waiting for me to get busy with these drawings. Um, so, but I like him, I like Hugo because I like how round he is. I do like drawing round. And on the next slide, uh, my calico cat. Well, I used to have a calico cat and that, is that cat is looking at a big elephant in a striped shirt and one of them says to the other you don't look just like me after that there's little fox again little fox is exuberant now how could i show that how could i show that joy i i had to elevate little fox so that she was no longer touching the ground and she's surrounded by those paper hearts so I, th I think that worked. I was very happy with that. Just showing that motion. Whenever I draw, whenever I work on a book, I want to make sure that the reader or the listener will see themselves. And so I try to put in as much variety as I possibly can. And somebody, a college student one asked, once asked me, are you doing this because it's politically correct? And I'm saying, no, it's the right thing to do. I want to make sure that this, this book, well, boys may feel a little left out, but it's filled with girls. And I wanted to make sure that there was a variety of complexions and hair styles and hair textures and also body shapes. So this was, this required a chart for me to keep straight all, all the configurations that I had. And you'll see a few more uh, paintings and drawings of characters which just have a whole variety. I think if you're drawing a community or a classroom or a group of people, it's very important to have as many people represented in that group as you can. The bus for us. This is the last page. After Tess has asked her friend Gus, is this the bus for us? She's asked him this seven times. And 
you can see that Gus is getting more and more and more exasperated with the whole situation. And each page has a new child coming on. So by the end, there are 10 students, five boys, five girls, plus the bus driver. Um, but this, this was, uh, this book has a life of its own. It has, a, it has a, an amazing quality to it because I would like to say that while there are visible differences, you know, you look at somebody and they're very different from you. Okay. There are also less visible differences. And so I heard from a mom who had a very teeny tiny kindergartner, kindergarten son. And he looked at this book and he saw the little redheaded girl reaching, stretching up to get to that first step. And he said, hey, mom, she's tiny like me. She's, she, she's having trouble stretching up to that first step. And it didn't occur to me. See, sometimes I learn this after, after I've drawn it. And I say, ooh, I'm smarter than I thought. Um, it didn't occur to me that that, that action would be recognizable to, to some child. And then there's the girl with the headscarf. And um, I was in a fourth grade class. And a girl came up and said, is, is this a little Muslim girl? And she was Muslim. And I said, yes, it is. And she turned around, held up the book and said, hey, everybody, there's a little Muslim girl in this book. So even though I try to be very conscientious and aware when I'm doing it, more things happen once it's out in the world. More interesting things, the way it's taken, the way it's understood. When it's once it's out in the world. Um, gonna move on to words. And oh, I'm sorry, we're still on, we're still on groups of people, and these are all just separate readers, um, different readers, different shapes, different colors, and as much as I could fit into one page. And the next one might also be from this series. Oh no, that's a, a classroom, a classroom series. Um and the next one is, oh, I don't know, the produce aisle in the grocery store. That's where I get a lot of my ideas. Um, but this is a family, a reading family, and they have books in front of them. They have how to bake pies. And I don't know if you can see this, but I included fairy tale references. So there's Jack and the Beanstalk over in, um, I, I can't figure out left from right on these, but in the lower corner, there's a little Jack climbing up that beanstalk. There's a pumpkin, which would symbolize Cinderella, right? And um, there are a couple of other references. I have to put my glasses on so I can see. Hmm. Oh, well, I'll let you figure it out. But I did do some fairy tales. Put the, oh, the princess and the pea, I think, is in there too. Uh, and that's fun to try and make a puzzle out of it as I'm, as I'm creating it. The next one is, I call this my kid grid. These were for a group called Family Reading Partnership and they each one appeared on a calendar in a different year. And so I think I did about 10 of them. Um, and I'm just showing you a few. But again, how do I make each one different? Oh, that's okay, that's okay. Go to the next one. <laughs> and this is from Feeding frenzies. Uh, again, a limited cast of characters. How do I make them different and interesting? And what are they doing? Well, uh, I'll, I'll get to some of that in a few slides coming up. Because this one has some fun language in it. Another poster for the reading group. And I, I loved thinking up the words to, to go with this. And it says, together let's read. We'll scoop out some time from our busy, busy day. Cupped in each other's company, we'll read ourselves away. And I think that's what, for me, that's what reading is. It's a little bit of an escape into a world I might know or I might not know. And this is my introduction to that world. 
And next up, oh yeah, from girls A to Z, we have Haifa likes to stay at home and Irene makes ice cream. This was written by Eve Bunting. And so it was a real, real honor and a thrill to illustrate for her because, oh, I don't know, what does she have? 300 books in, in print so far? And she was lovely and appreciative. And so it was, it was great to work with her. And this is from another book called No Place for a Pig. Miss Taffy wins a pig. And this was the subway that I rode to school on in New York City. Uh, and so it was another opportunity to populate it with everybody I could think of. I especially like the construction worker who's asleep. Um, I almost always get in a redhead. And I know that one of those in the, the, the one with the bow tie, the private school looking one, looks like a friend of mine. So not only do I put in people I don't know, I put in people I do know. Okay, they're pigs. They used to be kids, but now they're pigs. They had forgotten their manners. So pig lady comes along and gently reminds them, but they think of most everything else. It's important for the heroes of the book to be the engineers of the solution. They, um, they remember their manners. Uh, they say please and thank you. They chew with their mouths closed. I know, it's a fantasy world. Um, but they are really, remember I said I like to draw round figures? I loved drawing these plump little figures. So this one has um, one of my sons in it. And those happen to be the kids in his, uh, his class, his kindergarten class. So I put in their names. You can see I disguised them. Um, and they're all 33 now and <laughs> buying this book for their babies. I'm, I'm so touched. <laughs> announcing, announcing the importance of words. This is the goose from A Splendid Friend Indeed. And uh, as we continue, I will share some of those wild words that we have in there. Dear to read. Can you see that that's a, an anagram? You can see that, right? Well, and if I write dear somebody, dear to read, that's three anagrams. So I confess, I like to put puzzles into my pictures. Words. Of course words are important in a book. I mean, I might show you a wordless book later, but but each word, I mean, as the boss of the book, I get to pick the juiciest words. I get to pick words that are fun to say. Now, I think I'm the boss of the book, but I also have an editor and an art director. And they are so smart and have so much experience that when they make a recommendation, um, you know, sometimes I complain and grumble, but I always try it their way. And usually it turns out very well. But anyway, this is a number slumber. And a few pages in, it says 10 terribly tired tigers tiptoe to their beds. It goes down from there. Nine normally nimble newts rest their sleepy heads. Eight exhausted elephants curl up with their trunks. This is my favorite one. Seven slightly stinky skunks somersault into their bunks. If we have time, I'll show you the rest of the book later. But at some point, someone suggested that I take out terribly. They, they thought it was like an extra word. We didn't really need it. And I thought, no, this is the juiciness. This is the exciting stuff in the language. And I want, you know, it's a little bit of a tongue twister, but it's so satisfying to just say the whole line. So what's next? Oh, this is Feeding Frenzies. And it's about Malik, 
Now, this is kind of a tribute to two-year-old attitude. Malik made a yummy mud pie from mud, of course, with sandy sprinkles. Will he eat it? Oh, no, no, no. He made it for the chickadees. I could have chosen a different bird name. I could have chosen Robin, Sparrow, Cardinal, Blue Jay, any of the birds that I see out at our bird feeder. But what is more fun to say, Robin or chickadees? Yeah, you know what I think. Definitely chickadees. And the oh, no, no, no is a tribute to, um, to two-year-olds everywhere. And uh, I'm hearing that a lot at home now with our resident two-year-old grandchild. So I, I like it when reality imitates art. <clears throat> What's next? Oh, here's another word that is not commonly used. Boy, said Sam, you've been bamboozled. Grant and Antoine did not know what to say. They had just traded 20 yummy gummies and a bag of buggy bonbons for a time machine. All right. Bamboozled, as not everybody knows, means tricked. And again, I have to ask myself and my listeners, what is more fun to say, tricked or bamboozled? Now, I know I gave it a little, a little nudge there, but uh, I, want, I want the words to be fun, to be tons of fun, because I have the opportunity, because every page is an opportunity for, for juicy words and dynamic characters. I think we're near the end. Yes, we are. The end of the slideshow, not of the presentation. I just like you. Yes, I do. I think it would be absolutely wonderful if everybody heard this every day. If somebody said, I just like you. I have another book called Treasure, where Bear says to Goose, you are my treasure. And I think we need, we need to know that we are somebody's treasure, that somebody just likes us. Now, people do write love stories, but I've decided that I write like stories. So I think I will continue to do that. The one I just finished is called Zach and Ike are exactly alike. And they like being exactly alike. Now, of course, when you see them, you will know that they are not exactly alike, but they think they are. Um, in fact, I can even show you I'm going to show you some of the, the drawings that didn't make it into Zach and Ike. There's Ike. Well, I should pull this back a little so that you can, the light's better. And here are a couple of pictures of, look at the light, yeah. There's Zach and Ike. Oh, and Wuffy, the dog that's in the story. There they are again. These are rejected paintings for one reason or another. All I can say is by the end of this, I was very tired of drawing bicycles. If I never draw another bicycle, that would be just fine. So everything I'm showing you now, reject. Reject. And in a way, I mean, that's a good thing. I'm used to, used to doing it over and over because I know that each time, each time it gets better. I tighten it up and it, I can add the details that give you more information about the character, tell you who that character is. So if it's okay with you, I would like to read, oh, can we do What About Bear? Jess, do you still have that up? Wait, you're not on. I was talking while I was muted. Yes, 
Pull up. What about Bear? Just give me one second. All right. And we will get that on the screen. That'll be fun. And if anybody has questions and wants to think about questions to ask, we can do that too. I'd love to hear some comments or questions. Yes. If you guys have comments or questions, please put them in the Facebook comments and we will see them as they come through. Um, there's a little bit of a delay. So if, if you, if we don't see them right away, that's why. Um, but let me pull up what about bear to share it with you guys. Let's see. All right. Have to click one more button. All right. Oh, thank you. And there we are. Um, so we're talking about diversity. We're talking about using or showing different kinds of people. And yet, I'm going to read a book about a bear, a goose, and a fox. Now, they're not people, of course, but they are anthropomorphized. They do have human qualities that we will all recognize. And they are very different in terms of texture, size, and attitude. And I think you get to know each one. This is the third book in the series. It turned into a series. There are seven. Um, the first one is called A Splendid Friend Indeed. It's just Goose and Bear. And one is very quiet. The other is very expressive. So I think this continues in this particular story. What About Bear by Suzanne Bloom. That's me. What About Bear? Title page. And I'm giving you a clue as to what's going to happen. You can see they're having a lovely time playing leapfrog, but Bear is looking back, looking back to the suitcase. <clears throat> I don't know if Bear can see Little Fox's tail. Let's play! Oh my. They're deep into the suitcase now, pulling out, oh, I don't know, a jump rope or something. Can you see Little Fox's tail? Yes? Okay. Having a great time. But this time, instead of the tail, do you see Little Fox's head? Sometimes Little Fox is confused for a puppet but we'll soon see. Hey, can I play? Hmm. What do you think? Sure, jump right in. Yeah, that's how I try to catch a ball. I was like, ah, don't throw me that ball. And we know little fox isn't gonna catch it. I wanna play a different game. Hmm. Do you see trouble brewing? What about Bear? Bear is too big. I want to play a new game. We know what's coming. What about Bear? Bear is too grumpy. I wanted to use the word grumpy. I want to play another new game. Do you see how precariously that lid is? Do you think Bear is going to drop it on Little Fox? Hmm. The opportunity is there, but we know Bear is better than that. What about Bear? Bear is too far away. Next. But Bear is my friend. Wait, Bear, come back. What about me? Oh dear. Oh dear. Did you feel an emotional turning point when Little Fox said, what about me? 
I know sometimes people think Fox is little, so cute, he's so little, she's so sweet. But then they see how she's manipulating the other two. But now, I'm sorry to say, not everybody feels sorry for little Fox at this point. Let's see what happens. Bear is my big, old, sometimes grumpy friend. You can be our new friend. So, do you want to play with us? Yes, I do. Okay, jump right in. So, Bear comes through. He doesn't hold a grudge. He holds the jump ropes and Little Fox does double dutch. For me, this is an aspirational picture. I could not do double dutch ever to save my life. I can barely do singles. And by the end of the book, Little Fox is exhausted and falls asleep in Bear's arm. And they go on to have, oh, what, four more adventures together? It's a very satisfying series for me. Uh, Bear and Goose change a little bit as they grow through the stories, Little Fox changes. But basically they're, even though they learn something new about each other, their basic characteristics um, are consistent throughout the books. So uh, I hope you have a chance to take a look at them. So I was thinking that I would talk about um, some other books, other books and, and sort of how I feel about what I do. Because when you're writing and illustrating, you're like a detective. And it's really cool. It's kind of licensed to, to observe people and without being obnoxious to, you know, listen for interesting tidbits of conversation. So I call it detective work. Other people might call it being nosy, but it's keeping your eyes and ears open for those interesting tidbits. Um, and then sometimes you just collect enough pieces that they want to be in the same story together. So if anybody was going to ask, it takes me about six months to work on a book. And I say six months, um, but that includes a lot of procrastinating, productive procrastination. I try to get something else done and while, while I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but the idea for me is to create, create some emotional truth with the characters. Um, I love knowing the characters so well that I know they would or wouldn't do a certain thing. So I think I've been consistent throughout. One of my favorite moments of emotional truth is in a book by Pat Brisson called Melissa Parkington's Beautiful, Beautiful Hair. And this moment is at the end where she, Melissa Parkington, slips her hands into her mother's coat sleeves. I... I have to imagine that many of us have had this experience and it's just a very tender, intimate moment. And this book gave me an opportunity to show it. So I was, I was very happy about that. Um, in some of the other books, again, we can go with, I just like you. And I wanted to show you the companion piece. Here's the, the front where the bunny is inviting the bear onto the bench. And here's the elephant opposite the calico cat. And it says, you don't look just like me. You don't see the things I see. You don't walk just like me. You don't talk just like me. 
Still trying to get this left right thing on. So I'm trying to give each one of them a different stance, a different attitude. I like my characters to have attitude. You just like me. You just like me. You just like me. Here's uh, the one that was inspired by the, uh, the group of students, the group of listeners. I like your flip-flops. Thank you. I like your glasses. You do? I like to build things. Do you? I like to paint. Me too. And so some of our, our differences or our similarities cannot be, you can't tell by looking. You have to actually have an experience with that person. And here's another one. I like to take my time. I'm speedy. You're tall. Yes, indeedy. So until you sit down next to that speedy person or that slow person who likes to take their time, you cannot tell by looking. Let's be dancing. Let's be fancy. Sometimes I'm shy. So am I. So am I. I think the key word is sometimes, because sometimes we are all shy. And sometimes we're bold as brass. So even though I don't dress just like you, or do my hair like you do, I don't eat just like you, or even read just like you. Is somebody reading a blueprint, somebody reading braille, music, sewing pattern? Okay, you know what's coming. I just like you. I just like you. I just like you. Yes, I do. And here's our little hippopotamus with a party hat on his nose so that he can be just like his friend, the rhinoceros. I wondered if anybody had any questions. I have other books that we can talk about. We have a couple of questions. One is from Jennifer who asked, how do you identify with the polar bear character? <laughs> oh, I like how the polar bear is solid and quiet, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> I love the polar bear. I, I I don't feel like I'm the goose. I definitely feel like I'm, you know, I'll, I'll stand back and, and watch things. But I feel very, very close to the polar bear. <laughs> That's wonderful. And then Becca says, I'd be curious to hear you talk about how your personal experience differs when you're serving as author and illustrator versus when you're illustrating someone else's text. Oh, boy. Um... That's so interesting. When I'm doing both, then they sort of inform each other. I, I, I will think I have the manuscript all finished. And I may make some sketches before it's finished. But once I start making the sketches and lay it out in, in book form, I, it will suddenly become obvious that this needs to change, this needs to go on page seven instead of page five. Um, so I can, I can do those arrangements um, simultaneously, which is, a, I think it's a great, it's a great help. When I'm working for someone else, you know, you just hope they like it. Oh my gosh, you hope they like it. Um, and, and um, 
generally they there's not communication although you know that that's just generally uh and so if if the author is very famous and well known and if they would like a change to be made you you have to be ready to make that change if the author is a newcomer and if you are a more experienced illustrator um chances are you you know there may be some discussion but your judgment is is relied upon there so it, it's um a power balance but that's that's good that's the way it should be it's wonderful is there another question no other questions although um becca also said she really liked the the coined term of you writing like stories instead of love stories and <laughs> Yes, <laughs> such fun getting to see you reveal some of your Easter eggs in the books. Oh, yeah. That's really That's neat. Funny. Oh, yeah. There's there are a lot of personal personal items in my books. Um, I have put in my kids and my pets and my popcorn bowl and you know my throw rug and all that. Um, so yeah, I'm always on the lookout for for different and interesting things. And it's also in a way it's like, oh, I'm never gonna own that, but let me put it in a book. It's like, I never had a little red pedal car. You know, I always wanted one, too late now. Um, Cause you know, I have a blue Subaru, but uh, <laughs> I got to put it into girls A to Z. Yeah, a lot of nice details in that. Um, I, I was going to talk about a few other books. I see we're close to out of time or we are out of time. Um, but for me, it's books take me to places that I already know, which is great, but then they take me to places I never would otherwise get to. So it, you know, it could be another country. It could be another, another's into somebody's home, into somebody's heart. Um, and this is what we want to share. This is what we want to share, especially now, especially as, as we can have this close, tender activity with our children. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Suzanne. What a wonderful presentation. And everyone who came, thank you so much for coming. Please continue to join us this month. Check out the site below to see all about the wonderful DIA programs we'll be hosting for the rest of April. And thanks again, Suzanne. Good Bye -bye. night, everyone. Good night. And soon. Good thank night. you. Go read a book. <laughs> Bye.